Okay, thanks very much, Jen. So, good morning, everyone. Um, so, I'm now going to uh, talk a, a little bit about um, climate change and flood risk. Um, uh, and, uh, <coughs> excuse me, and I'm going to start by just rewinding a little bit. Jane's given us a very detailed account of some of the things that we've learned from the flooding that's occurred um, during this past winter. I want to uh, just rewind slightly to two years ago to um, uh, January uh, 2014. Um, um, during that period, we were in the midst of uh, severe flooding and quite prolonged flooding over large parts of the south of England in particular, um, specifically in the, in the Thames catchments. Um, and uh, at this time, the Prime Minister David Cameron stood up um, and said essentially that uh, he thought that those floods that we were experiencing were probably connected to climate change. Um, he suspected they were probably linked to climate change. Uh, and of course, this begs a scientific question, you know, what's, what's the evidence um, uh, to support that statement? And um, when uh, David Cameron said this, I thought, well, we've, we've been here before, haven't we? Because um, rewinding even uh, a little bit further back, this is the then Deputy Prime Minister John Prescott up to his knees in it on the BBC website in November 2000, when, of course, we also experienced prolonged and widespread flooding um, across many parts of the country. And at that time, uh, John Prescott um, also said that uh, he suspected um, that uh, the flooding was in some way connected to global warming. Um, when he said this, uh, the Department of Environment quite reasonably thought, uh, well, hang on a minute, let's, uh, let's work out what the evidence for this kind of statement is. Um, and uh, as a result of that, um, asking that question, they commissioned some research work um, uh, uh, carried out by quite a large team of scientists from the Met Office um, and the Centre for Ecology and Hydrology, so that's the, uh, the country's national research institute for hydrological science. I was working there at the time before I joined JBA um, and, and led the team uh, uh, that wrote that study. Um, and, of course, one of the great difficulties in, in, in analysing, uh, uh, looking for a climate change fingerprint in, in flood events um, is that it's very difficult, and any hydrologist will, will, will know this, it's very difficult to identify really compelling, clear-cut evidence of uh, trends in historical records of flow data. So, looking at the Thames catchment in particular, um, this, is the, this is the catchment boundary for the River Thames, and throughout this talk, I'm going to be referring to um, the Thames as it drains down to Teddington Weir. So Teddington Weir is the point at which there's a, effectively a separation between the tidal uh, Thames and the fluvial river Thames. So if, if you like, it's, it's, it's the point at which the river turns into an estuary. Um, so we're, we're looking here at a time series, a plot of the, uh, the annual maximum, so the, the largest <coughs> flows recorded at Teddington Weir um, historically, and the Thames is a really interesting catchment from a science point of view because it has one of the longest high quality historical records um, of river flows anywhere in the world really, so going right the way back into the 19th century. And what you can see on the graph here are sort of two kind of standard approaches to trying to fit some kind of trend line through that data. So one's a linear trend, one is a, a, a smoothed um, uh, estimator. Um, and okay, you know, there's maybe some hint, some suggestion of an upward trend there, but that's somewhat um, confounded by the fact that some of the very largest flood events historically have, have occurred um, even back uh, into the 19th century and certainly <coughs> early 20th century. So from this kind of analysis, it's very, it was very difficult to provide any kind of conclusive evidence to say, well, there's clear signs of some sort of climate change signal against this backdrop of very variable, you know, high degree of variability in, 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 in those data. So we, we wrote this kind of results up. Um, we followed all the latest government guidance uh, on communicating scientific uncertainty. Uh, our report was published and the following day the Times uh, ran a piece on it that said flooding baffles scientists, which isn't quite uh, what we actually <laughs> said. Uh, but. Um, in retrospect, I, I suppose I can see why they, uh, why they came up with that headline. Uh, and our comment really was to, you know, exactly as I've just explained, that we couldn't, we couldn't categorically um, uh, provide any sort of 
uh, attribution of, of that one flood event to climate change. So I'm going to fast forward again now and bring us back up to date and, and look at what we can say now. Um, what we can say now, and this is with reference to the flooding in winter 13-14 in the Thames, is that actually um, there is evidence to say that historical climate change, so greenhouse gas emissions since the Industrial Revolution, has already um, put around about a thousand properties at additional risk of flooding within the Thames River catchment. So remember, this isn't taking account of sea level uh, rises or storm surges. We're just looking at the, at the river catchments. So that's quite a, a strong statement in, in, in relative terms compared to the total number of properties in, in the Thames River Basin, of course, a thousand is, is, is still a relatively small number. It's clearly not a small number if you're one of those um, affected properties. Um, and there's a wide uncertainty range around this. So um, that estimate is bracketed between minus 4,000 and plus 8,000. So that, that, that does seem like quite a wide range. As I'll come on to show you, um, there's still a very strong um, message in here on the balance of probabilities that this is a, a fairly robust um, indicator that, that, that the increase uh, in risk is, is real. There's also some small print. Um, I, I'm, not, um, <laughs> I'm not trying to be uh, deliberately um, concealing here. Um, I was hoping it might be just about legible at this scale, but maybe it isn't. But basically, that's there almost just to remind me to point out that all these types of scientific studies do have a set of assumptions behind them, and often actually they're quite difficult to, 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 to explain and, and to digest. But here, essentially, um, the, the, the assumptions are that we, you know, that we have to have some confidence in the climate models that are being used in this analysis, which I'll explain about in a minute. Um, but there is quite a lot of evidence and, and investigation behind those to suggest that they're reliable. Um, and we have to make a few assumptions in there about the way in which we count property damages and so on, which again, I'll, 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 I'll explain about. <clears throat> um, so what I'm going to do now is just briefly summarize um, the analysis behind that headline results of a thousand properties at additional risk due to climate change. And really what I'm doing here is uh, summarizing results that were published um, in February this year in a, in a journal paper in Nature Climate Change. Um, this is a study that was led by uh, the Environmental Change Institute at Oxford University. Um, so the lead author here was uh, Natalie Schaller, post postdoctoral researcher there, with input from the Centre for Ecology and Hydrology that we've mentioned a number of times. Um, myself and a colleague, Jess Skeggs. Um, so I was involved in this through the JBA Trust, which is our um, uh, not-for-profit research foundation. And, and working with Jess in JBA risk management to use, uh, to use our, our flood mapping data. And there were a number of other um, institutions in, involved in this study, so you can, you can see them uh, listed uh, there, um, including the Met Office. <coughs> um, and the starting point here was to look at well, what, what was actually happening um, uh, during the winter of 2013-14. So here we have a graph showing um, historical series of rainfall. This is rainfall recorded um, at, uh, at Oxford. Again, an exceptionally long, um, high-quality data series going, going way back um, into, into, the, uh, into the 19th century and beyond. Um, and uh, this plot shows uh, each of these bars is the uh, January um, rainfall recorded at Oxford. Um, here's, the, uh, here's the January 2014 data, which clearly sits right at the extreme end there. Um, it's, it's, it's a, it was a record-breaking uh, extreme rainfall. And you can see plotted in here also a, 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 a type of trend analysis, which again, as with the river flows um, in, in London at Teddington Weir, you know, maybe there's some sort of hints of slight increases there, but it's, you know, there's a lot of variability as well. Um, and it's, it's difficult to sort of identify a conclusive um, uh, definitive trend uh, in there. There's also perhaps a slight suggestion if you kind of look at the, the density of these bars, so um, in the earlier period of the record, uh, quite a few of the Januaries there were um, below the long-term average. As we move into the later parts of the record, more and more of these blue bars appear where, where January was above the, uh, the long-term average, so perhaps there's a slight shift indicated there towards more extreme rainfall. But certainly we're really interested in understanding what's going on during this exceptional event um, that we had two, two years ago. 
Um, so that's the kind of local scale scientific uh, data that we have, the, the measurements of, of rainfall um, from a gauge in, in Oxford. But we also, of course, now have you know, really good information about what's going on at global scale. So what you're looking at here um, is a map of sea surface temperatures. Sea surface temperature is one of the critical parameters within the global climate system. And this is data that's um, produced from a range of observation networks and, and, and model interpretations. Uh, and this shows um, the, uh, the difference, the anomaly, as, as, as uh, climatologists would call it, between um, the sea surface temperatures that were, that were observed during the winter of 2013-14 uh, December, January, February, D DJF, versus the long-term background values. Um, so it's the deviations from the normal conditions. And what we see is this patch of blue here, which indicates colder than normal uh, uh, sea surface conditions over the North Atlantic. Um, and then also some of these red patches around the, in the Caribbean, the Gulf, uh, and elsewhere, um, indicating warmer than usual conditions. So somehow, this kind of um, unusually cold uh, North Atlantic um, was connected to the weather systems that, that ultimately led to the flooding we saw in, in southern England. So <coughs> um, the analysis um, that was conducted by the research team here um, was then involved saying, well, OK, um, if we take this as indicative of what was going on uh, during the winter of 2013-14, what might have happened? What could the weather have looked like if we then somehow subtracted out um, the influence of uh, anthropogenic uh, greenhouse gas emissions um, since the Industrial Revolution? And we can, uh, we can do that, we can answer that kind of question by looking at results from global climate models that have been run as a kind of numerical laboratory experiment in which, in which the global climate is simulated with all the kind of historical greenhouse gas emissions included, and then a second simulation is performed in which uh, the atmosphere has been held at its, in its pre-industrial state. So we're kind of comparing the real world with, a, with model simulations of a, a counterfactual world in which um, we take out the effects of uh, greenhouse gas emissions. And these plots, these are results from 11 global climate models produced by various different scientific research institutes around the world. So this is the Met Office model down here, showing um, the effect on sea surface temperature patterns over the winter period if we uh, take, uh, perform that experiment in which we subtract um, the, uh, um, the effects of greenhouse gas emissions from um, the present day real atmosphere. So we see these sort of changes in, in average sea surface temperature. Uh, and so what these maps are showing in effect at that global scale with respect to those sea surface temperatures is, is the effect of human greenhouse gas emissions or industrial greenhouse gas emissions on those average temperatures. Uh, so the, th the question then is what impact would that have on the weather? So those plots are of kind of long-term or seasonal average climate conditions. What we want to do is then connect those um, average conditions to actual weather events that might drive flooding. Um, and and, and uh, this is where um, uh, we made use of a very large, um, very large scale uh, computing experiment called climateprediction.net, um, which runs a model for weather at home. So this is an Oxford University initiative that essentially uses networks of home computers and their spare processing capacity to run thousands and thousands of climate and weather models in order to build up big ensembles, uh, ensemble simulations. Um, and so what, what's been done here is to move from the kind of very coarse scale global model data. So you can see here these pixels, these boxes represent the large grid, coarse grid of, a, of the global <coughs> models that, that we saw on the, on the previous slide. And, and to convert those through into much higher resolution data, this is down to 50 kilometer grid scale. Um, that, that, that can start to resolve weather features in a more realistic way. And, and I should add here that you know, this 50 kilometer scale is something that's being reduced all the time as, as these kind of models advance. Uh, <coughs> so the, the team at Oxford um, uh, kicked off uh, a, a very large ensemble experiment in which they um, effectively used this weather at home modeling process to generate um, uh, 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 simulations of plausible, physically possible weather conditions that could have occurred 
um, both for the, the real sea surface temperatures, so this is ensemble A, um, that were experienced in winter 1314, and then for all of these 11 sets of pre-industrial um, uh, weather conditions, so these, are, these were experiments that gave simulations of the weather as it might have been um, without greenhouse gas emissions, without climate change, uh, and in total there was something like 135,000 um, uh, simulations of winter weather produced during this experiment. So that number and those ensembles are really important because they're a way of allowing us to perform an analysis that incorporates a realistic view of the uncertainty and the data and the uncertainty in the models. Every single one of those 135,000 simulations has got tiny little perturbations in it that represent that uncertainty. So we're not just, you know, we're not just looking at one model prediction um, that could be wrong. We're looking at a huge range of, if you like, replications of an experiment to account for the, the experimental uncertainty. And so, what do the results show? Well, um, as I said, each ensemble experiment is, in effect, a, a, a simulation of what the weather might have looked like um, uh, with and without climate change uh, included. Uh, and those um, thousands of simulations, of course, produce weather events um, that range in severity from very severe to less severe. Uh, and uh, we can extract all of those weather events from each of the simulations and look at their probabilities within, within each of those ensembles and, and express the probability also in terms of a return period. Uh, and, so, uh, and, the, and therefore generate curves that look like this. So this result is for um, January mean precipitation. So this is the thing that was really extreme in, 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 in uh, January 2014. It was the 30-day the average rainfall that was really extreme. The red curve here shows results um, for uh, the, the world as it is now, so for the actual real um, climate that we have now. And each of those blue curves then shows the equivalent results for one of those model ensembles in which we've removed the effects of climate change. And so the simple way to interpret this is to say that if we were to experience a weather event um, with a return period of 100 years, let's say, what we're seeing is that the January mean rainfall in the real world, as we have it now, is more severe at that return period than any of those, or virtually all of those simulations um, for a world with a pre-industrial climate. Uh, or to put it another way, the effect of the climate change of the greenhouse